And so, without further ado, I want to ask Glenn to come up and preach his message. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation of being here. Now that I've crossed the three score and ten years, um, I'm just glad to be anywhere. <laughs> I'm conscious of how precious time is. Every contestant in a race aspires to cross the finish line well, thereby inspiring others to finish well. Of course, the contestant must do this before they expire. So I have a motto for the rest of my life. I want to aspire to inspire before I expire. <laughs> so today, I want to inspire. Now, <clears throat> uh, Joe, if I have your permission, I'd like to sing a rather unconventional song, but uh, it is to honor three classes of people, and they're all here today. They're the three classes. Uh, number one, the hard-working Americans that keep the wheels of commerce turning. The second group, the people that work hard in the background, especially at a conference like this, to make things and accommodations that we are enjoying so much. If you would know the amount of work that goes on off stage, we'd probably appreciate it more. Thank you so much. And then it's my class of people. My class is the old people. And sometimes all of these people in every category just simply get wore out. But when we get to heaven with Jesus our King, 10 million years still fresh as the spring, we'll be happy and free, and our bodies won't be wore out. Well, you come home at night, and you sit down for a bite, and you're wore out. Then you're hardly able to get up from the table because you're wore out. Then you crawl into bed, and you sleep like you're dead because you're wore out. And in the morning when you get, wake up, you can hardly get up because you're wore out. But when we get to heaven with Jesus our King, 10 million years still fresh as the spring, we'll be happy and free, and our bodies won't be wore out. <laughs> well, you wake up on Sunday, and you dread to see Monday because you're wore out. Then you sit in the church, and your back starts to hurt because it's wore out. Then the choir starts to sing, and you don't feel a thing because you're wore out. And you, hope that, and, and you hope the sermon and song, they won't be very long because you're wore out. But when we get to heaven with Jesus our King, 10 million years still fresh as the spring, we'll be happy and free, and our, Bible, and our bodies won't be wore out. Well, you take out your wife, in your car for a drive, and yes, it's wore out. <laughs> and your wife starts to worry as you get in a hurry because it's wore out. Then you don't know where you're at, and the old tire's going flat because it's wore out. <laughs> and from the sound of the motor, You'll soon have to tow her because it's wore out. <laughs> but when we get to heaven with Jesus our King, 10 million years still fresh as the spring, we'll be happy and free, and our bodies won't be wore out.
We want to open our Bibles this morning to Job, the book of Job, in Job chapter 39. I think stepping out of the boat is a wonderful theme for this week's conference. But the title of my message is Staying, Stay in the Harness. And I believe that by the end of the message you'll see that's not a contradiction, but it's complementary to stepping out of the boat. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I feel like we're in the house of the Lord. And what a blessing it is. David also said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. There's no better place to learn about the things of God than a good Bible-believing church. It's a wonderful thing to be at the right place, at the right time, with the right people, doing the right thing. That speaks of being in the center of God's will. I marvel at the times that the Bible uses examples from nature to illustrate spiritual truths and principles. Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They spin not, they toil not. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. He said, behold the birds, the fowl of the air. They don't labor, they don't gather in their barns, yet our Heavenly Father feeds them. There are seven verses in the book of Job that deal with horses. They're used to, these verses are used to teach us character. Now today, my message will focus more on a horse than a man. But before getting into my personal story, let's first see what God's instruction to Job was by way of the workhorse, or should I say, the war horses. I'm in Job chapter 39, and I want to look at verse 19. He says, Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth in the valley and rejoices in, this, in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed one. Now, anybody that knows anything about horses knows that when they're pawing in the valley, they're raring to go. They want to go forward. They want to get into the... And here it is with the armed men. Mind you, these were men with spears and knives and, and, and that, that were prepared to kill. He says in the next verse, He mocketh at fear and is not affrighted, neither turneth he back from the sword. He's not afraid. You see, these horses were trained to ride right into danger. The quiver rattled against him, the glittering spear and the shield. Now, these are things that would normally scare horses, but not these horses. These horses were trained for battle. They were facing mortal dangers, but they gloried in their strength. They were zealous. Does not the Bible say it is, it, it is a good thing uh, to be zealous? It, it is good to be zealous in a good thing. Galatians chapter 4. And so he says, He swalloweth the ground with fierceness and rage. Neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. In other words, swallow the ground is galloping as he galloped across the plains. It was like a rumbling thunder in the distance. He saith among the trumpets, trumpets Ha ha! And he smelleth the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. These horses were bold. They were daring. They were not afraid. Some of these horses wouldn't make it out alive, and yet they were raring to go. Dear God, thank you for this conference. And bless the hard work that is going into this to make this such a beautiful place and a place for us to be edified and build up and encouraged and strengthened this week. Now I now humbly and yet fervently ask you, Lord, help me to use wisely the precious time slot that is granted to me and not waste other people's time. Give me grace, I pray, to magnify and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is in his name I pray. Amen. 
Perhaps I have a greater affinity for this scripture because over 60 years of my 73 years, that's my age, were spent around and with horses. 45 years of my uh, life, my living was made with horses. Now, for 25 of those 45 years, I owned and operated the Mark Twain Clopper. This was a horse-drawn tour in Hannibal, Missouri, where I took people up and down the streets of Main Street and, and the Mississippi there and told them um, about, about the town. Yes, it was hard enough for me to harness and hitch the horse. You see, when I was two years old, I had polio in 1952 before the vaccine came out. And, and so that uh, forever would change my life. I'll be giving my testimony concerning that of my salvation at uh, Pastor Jerry Armand's church at uh, West Salem on this coming Sunday. But when I dropped into the driver's seat, the workload was now on the horse. Let's just say he did my walking for me, and I did his talking for him. And I told him, if he ever does any talking, I'll be do, sure and do some fast walking. <laughs> I really enjoyed that part of my life, just as I'm enjoying myself in this stage of my life. My objective today is threefold, to stir you up for the things of God. And that's exactly what Peter was doing when he wrote his second letter to the church. He said, this second letter, beloved, and I write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. One of the reasons people don't get stirred up in church hearing preaching is because their minds are dwelling on impure things. Number two, to encourage you to step out on faith. Isn't that what this conference is all about? And number three, to see decisions made here, today, now. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Decisions that will make a permanent impact on a life. You see, I'm so glad we are given a choice. God says in, in the... Uh, in Deuteronomy, he says, Behold, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your children may live. Being a tour guide driving a wagon, I had the red fringe on top, uh, could haul 15 to 20 adults comfortably, depending on the size of the adults, shall we say. <laughs> it was a 20-minute ride. And I love to tell stories and facts about historical Hannibal, about Mark Twain's boyhood, about Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. And, and yes, uh, as we would go along, I would throw in a couple jokes just to spice things up. We'd be going down, down uh, the street, and I'd say, folks, I want you to look at my horse. Did you know that this horse has got more hair on the one side than the other side? I said, look at the horse, take a careful look, tell me which side, and they would come up with the most weird answers. <laughs> I said, don't you think the outside has got more than the inside? <laughs> We'd be going down Main Street, and I said, look at these buildings. Now, these buildings were built back in the 1840s, and some even in the 1830s. But did you notice they're only two and three stories high? Why do you think they didn't build them any taller? And one, one person said, well, I guess they didn't have any taller ladders. I said, oh, come on. New York City was having skyscrapers back then already. It's not that. When they couldn't get it, I said, well, you know, if they would build them any taller, that would have been another story. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. For those of you who didn't get that, it'll catch up with you about next Tuesday. <laughs> now, I, I used six or seven different horses, some whose names I don't even remember. But today, I want to talk about my favorite horse. His name, he was a half Belgian, big, heavy horse. His name was King. Now, compared to the other horses, King stood head and tail taller than the others. 
not by way of stature, but because he was, uh, he was so likable and his behavior and his faithfulness. Even the Bible says, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. And King was a happy horse. You see, I carried treats with me, and uh, he got to eat the, he, eat the apples uh, or donuts. or uh, It didn't matter to him it was day old or a week old. He loved, they loved pastries. Kids petted him all day long. They sat on the horse for pictures, and they would, uh, families would take family pictures, group pictures. The horse, King, was always the center of those pictures. Now, one of the things that made, that added so much value to King's life was the fact that he was so submissive. Now, since I had polio, uh, I had a lot of limitations in my life. I had to put the harness on in, in pieces instead of like normal people would. And, uh, <clears throat> but King, in order for me to get the bridle on his head, he'd have to put his head way down. That was submission. Now, King had strength. Oh, I'm telling you, uh, lots of it. Can you imagine 1,800 pounds, mostly muscles? With that kind of strength, he could have wreaked havoc all around him, around himself, and quickly ended his happy career as well. But if King was to fulfill his purpose in life, he needed to submit to a higher authority and a superior wisdom to his own. And that's just what he did. Now, Scripture tells us to submit ourselves to God voluntarily. Submission is all about a relationship of love and respect to the one you are submitting to. Husbands, it makes it a lot easier for your wife to submit to you if you are totally submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. A day I will never forget. And there's 25 years, there's a lot of days in there that I totally forgot, can't remember a thing about it. But here's a day I'll never forget. Um, it stands out from the others. King and I were parked waiting for our next passengers. When a little girl, she was about three or four years old, she came running at top speed down the cobblestone incline toward the horse. She was so excited to see a live horse. By the way, this was the first time some of these, even teenagers, would ever see a, a real horse. One day, a girl came, a teenage girl, and she said, Sir, may I ask you a question? I said, try me. And she said, uh, is, this, is this a real horse, or is he a mechanical horse? <laughs> I want to say, step a little closer and smell the horse. <clears throat> And so back to the little girl, she never slowed down. She ran smack dab into King's front right leg. Now, when a horse gets tapped or bumped against his leg, the natural thing for him to do is to lift up that foot. And when he did that, that little girl's right leg slid right underneath that where that hoof would pack, come back down with a heavy metal shoe and would put it right on the little girl's leg. The natural thing for a horse to do when you put that foot down is now lift the other foot, which puts the horse's whole weight on the foot he had just lifted. But King did the unnatural thing. When he felt the softness of that leg, he lifted the foot the second time. And by that time, the mother was on top of that little girl, and she grabbed that little girl and picked her up, and there was just a slight mark on her leg and in no time at all, she was laughing and petting the horse, and everything was okay. But when I got back on that seat, and they went on their merry way, I bowed my head with heartfelt thanksgiving to God for his goodness. The Bible says it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And let me say it loud and clear, I was so pleased with my horse named King. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord, the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. That's what we do together today. Isn't it wonderful? He said, 
He said, the angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him and delivereth them. I felt like the angel of the Lord had protected me because we could have been on our way to the hospital with a little girl that had her foot, had her leg, her thigh, and her shin could have been crushed by the horse's heavy weight. So you see, not only was King strong, he was also very smart. We had this communication that only King and I understood. It happened about once a day. I would tell my passengers, at this time, we shall go off course, away from the pedestrians in a vacant lot where King will do his thing. Now, for some of you that need more clarification of that, where King went potty. Now, as I stopped the horse and he did his thing, the people that were familiar with horses were the most astonished. Some of them would say, I can hardly believe my own eyes. And he'd say, driver, how did you train this horse to do this? I was trying to give my business a plug for the next year. I said, you come back next year and I'll tell you. <clears throat> but I do say it pays well to have a working relationship in interacting with your animals, especially those animals providing a living for you. In parentheses, this does not include any cats. But the Bible says a righteous man regardeth, thank you for that amen, regardeth the life of his beast, a righteous man. We owe it to be good to the animals. I'm not for the animal rights class, but I'm all about animal welfare. There's a difference. Now, King actually was more famous than he ever knew. One year, I was touring a busload of third graders, and while giving my narration, a kid said, hey, driver, we have a picture of your horse, King in our social study book. And I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. They got a picture of a horse hitched to something, and he, he uh, connects it with this rig. At the end of the tour, one of the teachers came and said, Billy was right. This picture of this rig is in our social study book. I said, really? She said, indeed. I said, wow. And she said, would you like to, for me to send you a picture? Give me your address. Not only did she send me a picture, but she sent me the book. I still show off the book to folks sometimes and just look at the picture and smile. Wow. Another time, my insurance man called me, and he said, Mr. Yoder, I sent you a calendar, and I want you to look on the September month. And there was King on a full-size scale picture for the September month. I don't know who got the picture, when they got the picture, but I was in it. Yes, King indeed was a very special horse. I really loved my horse called King. I suppose it was an earlier generations of horses just like King that gave rise to the phrase, it was just good horse sense that caused me to do that at the right time, at the right place. But folks, even today, horses in general have more sense than the average Democrat, I mean, uh, the... <laughs> the, the average politician. <laughs> God help us. We need more statesmen instead of politicians. The Bible says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Yeah. Folks, I submit to you that America is fixing to do some mourning here. I think we're already under the judgment hand of God. Because the Bible says righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is reproach to any people. And yes, killing babies is a sin. Amen. Promoting homosexuality is a sin. Amen. And is there any wonder... There's confusion among our kids concerning their gender when we just elected a Supreme Court justice that can't give you the definition of what a woman is. The Bible says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he have chosen for his own inheritance. 
Oh, it was a beautiful day. Friday the 13th, June of 2003. Yes, Friday the 13th. The temperature was perfect. It was a cool day. King never even broke a sweat all that day. I specifically remember starting out the day, King was his usual self, full of equine energy. This would be an important day because I had a group of 40 Girl Scouts that would be riding with me. So I had set 1 o'clock, they were scheduled to come, set that time apart just for the Girl Scouts. Do you know what's more exciting than 20 Girl Scouts? That would be 40 Girl Scouts. <laughs> Don't get ahead of my story. <laughs> they got there on time. They were highly excited. They were piling on that wagon. And I said, now look, we can take make two tours out of this so you don't have to be crowded. But the girl said, no, 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 we want to all go together. It'll be more fun if we can all be together. <laughs> and so I said, we'll see. And so they loaded up. There was two teachers or mothers, I suppose. One required a little more room than the other. <laughs> and so, but would you believe they all squeezed on there. And we went down Main Street. I mean, there was girls hanging out on both sides of the wagon. They were laughing and cheering and getting everyone's attention as we were going down Main Street along the banks of the Mississippi. We even went up a couple blocks on Broadway. We went through the roller coaster. That was just a big dip in the street, but King always sped up. And as we went through that, those girls screamed like so many Comanche Indians. <laughs> but what a blast we had. Um, that the, uh, there was, there was, at the end of the tour, there's lots of picture taken. And uh, I always carried treats with me, like I said. And so the girls that were brave enough got to feed the horse. And the girls hugged and clung to King. king. In fact, those, those, uh, the ones in charge of the tour had to literally drag those girls away to the next attraction, which they had no interest in anyhow. They wanted to stay with a horse. But I would just dare to say, I would bet you that each one of those girls still cherishes vivid memories, vivid memories of that day exactly 20 years ago this year. I myself was relishing the goodness of the day as we headed back toward King's stable. That was one half mile up the Mississippi. King was, uh, he stepped higher and faster as he clipped along toward the barn to his ration of sweet mix. That was crushed grain mixed with dried molasses. I mean, he would walk over anybody else besides me to get to that. Now, suddenly, as we were going up the street, we were less than a block away from the barn. King's head went way up. He looked way up. I mean, he looked so scared. He held his head high as if he was seeing a ghost in front of him. He slowed to a stop, and he started shaking and trembling all over. His legs wobbled and buckled as he fell down on his right side. Crack! The shafts on the right side broke as he fell. I spoke in a voice that didn't sound like my own. I said, oh, no, no, King. I said, please, get back up. Please, please. And with great effort, he attempted hard to rise again. I said, yes. Yes, you can do it, king. Only to see him fall the second time, this time on the left side, and crack the other shafts was broken. I jumped off of the wagon. As I did so, I saw his head drop to the street. The best horse I ever owned the horse, never loved one better than this one, was dead. I knelt on both knees in front of him, laying my hands 
on his warm nose. There, I wept. His eyes were still fully open, as if to say, I wanted to do more. I wanted to go all the way home, but either I had an aneurysm or a heart attack. And I wept some more. As I was looking at that horse there, still on my knees, it struck me to the heart to realize King was not only still in the harness, he was still hitched to the wagon. It would be the first time that I ever took a bridle off of a dead horse. That means King was faithful to the very end, doing what he was meant to do. Dear God, oh God, would you burn this lesson deep into my heart. Give me a desire and a passion in my soul to end strong, to stay in the harness, if you would. I wonder if somebody would come and give me some very light music. I want you to keep looking this way. But I wonder if there's not someone here today that may be under tremendous pressure right now. And you're tempted just to get out of the harness. No more pressure. No more tears. I want to get it back away from this heavy responsibility. It's a workload that's too hard. David felt something similar to this when he said, Oh, that I had wings of a dove and I would fly away. I would go wander far into the wilderness and remain there. King, the, 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 David was the king and he was not made for the wilderness. He had to be in the kingdom. But the pressure was so great. Now, folks, the truth is, all of us face discouragement. All of us face defeat. And here's a tough one. Disapproval. There are folks here today that are hurting because of the disapproval from the loved ones of them just being here. The temptation, therefore, is to get out of the harness. And to go to pasture. Just go out in the pasture. You see, the pasture speaks of comfort. The pasture speaks of leisure. The pasture speaks of shade, trees, and rippling brooks. But in the pasture, you will not make an impact on anyone. The only way you will impact the generation for Jesus Christ is if you stay in the harness. Hitched to a cause that is bigger than yourself. Can I tell you? Nothing ever great comes from a comfort zone. You've heard about Peter stepping out of the boat. Yeah, but he started to sink. But Peter, the only one of the disciples, stepped out of the boat there at a very dangerous place and it was Peter the only one in history of mankind that walked on water and yes he started to sink and so will you if you step out of the boat but you will experience the mighty hand of God God says a good man a good man um, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And though he fall, yet shall he not utterly be cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his right hand. David goes on to say, I was young and now I am old. I can say that too. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Nothing ever great comes from a comfort zone. And of course it's more comfortable to stay in the boat. But the challenge this week is to step out of the boat. 
Remember the Titanic? After it hit the iceberg, it was doomed to sink in two and a half hours. In fact, uh, Thomas Smith, Mr. Smith, and Mr. Andrews got together and they calculated right down pretty much to the, to the, to the, to within the 10 minutes of when it would sink. They understood the boat. The women and children were commanded to go on the lifeboats first. And as they looked, the lifeboats hanging out over the side, they looked down 60 feet down to black, cold, icy water. They turned around and looked at the comfortable lights of the Titanic. They must have gripped the railings tighter than ever and said, I'm not stepping out. Can I tell you, everybody that chose to stay with the boat that night, in the boat, perished. Among the 1,700 that perished. But there were those who stepped out, and thereby their lives were saved. You see, the Titanic seemed safer. The Titanic looked safer. And the Titanic most definitely felt safer. But only those who stepped out were saved. That night, stepping out of the boat was a life and death matter. I wonder if I'm looking at somebody today. You are facing a decision. You are quibbling with it right now. And that could also be a life and death matter. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Proverbs chapter 1. Because that they hated knowledge, they did not choose to fear the Lord. If you're living in the fear of the Lord today, it's because you chose it. You're not born with the fear of the Lord. You have to choose it. Choose you this day. It's ironic that that first lifeboat went down. A capacity of 60 passengers. It went down with only 15 people in it. 45 seats could have saved 45 more lives that perished that night. Let's stand together. As the music plays, this is invitation time. Do not hold back. Let the Spirit of God have His way in your life. If you need to deal with something, if you need to solidify a decision that you're toying with this morning, actually, you already know what you're supposed to do. Why don't you come and kneel at the altar up here and just solidify that and talk to God about it. We don't know, I don't know, and I don't need to know, but God needs to hear from you. You see, time is running out. He says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. That suggests there's a time coming when it's too late to call upon him. There's a time coming when it's too late to be saved. Today, if you're not sure that your name is written in heaven, oh, would you come? We'll show you from the Word of God. The Bible says, examine yourselves. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves that how Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. You don't want to be a reprobate. Would you come? Would you come? The last breath that my horse king took, he was still in the harness. The last steps he made in this life, he was still pulling the wagon. I want to be faithful unto the very end. Oh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I urge you, I charge you, stay on course. Stay in the harness. God has made a harness that fits you exactly.
Brother Joe. There was a man of the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night, at night, when no one could see him. And he said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. It was telling me, climb out of the boat, take a walk on the way. Some places you'll never go till you step out. might think you're insane just climb out of the boat 